All right, Liz, go ahead. Good evening. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Liz Hoddle, the Director of Events and Marketing of Politics and Prose, and welcome to our Friday night short story party. Um, I'm so happy to be here with these dynamic writers and with all of you out there to celebrate Laura Vandenberg's new collection, I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, and to talk about the strange and wonderful gift or experience that is a short story. At any time during the event, you can click on the link in the chat to purchase tonight's book on PNP's website or books by any of the authors that are featured here tonight. Um, please, please remember that these book sales enable us to continue to bring you the programming that we're so proud of. We have to have these sales to keep bringing this to you. Um, so we ask you to support us and the author um, by buying a book tonight. Um, you can ask a question at any point in the little question thing at the bottom, and we'll make sure to ask that during the Q&A. Um, okay, Laura Vandenberg is a writer and teacher and the author of two previous collections of stories, The Isle of Youth and What the World Will Look Like When All the Water Leaves Us, and the novels Find Me in the Third Hotel. Um, I read her new collection in the early moments of the pandemic, and I kept telling everyone that if Station Eleven uncannily kind of predicted the symptoms and realities of a pandemic, this collection did the same for our internal lives, offering a sort of play-by-play -play of our emotions during these endless months of self-isolation and dread. Laura writes about loneliness and grief better than almost any other living writer. And in the stories here, she brings together a collection of kind of modern ghost stories with the same level of precision and emotional accuracy she's, that has defined all of her work. She will be joined tonight by three writers who have ex worked extensively in short stories, using their distinctive voices and methods in so many completely different ways, which kind of um, just shows the flexibility and possibilities of the form. Amber Sparks is the author of several collections, including May We Shed These Human Bodies, as well as And I Do Not Forgive You, Stories and Other Revenges. Tanya James is the author of the novels Atlas of the Unknowns and The Tusk That Did the Damage, and the short story collection Aerograms. Rian Amalkar Scott is the author of two award-winning short story collections, The World Doesn't Require You and Insurrections. Please help me welcome all of them to Politics and Prose Live. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, so I think our plan for this evening, um, so yeah, thank you all for being here. I'm super psyched to talk to three writers I admire so much about um, short stories and why we love them. Um, I think we're going to read for a minute and then talk short stories, and then we will um, kick it over to audience Q&A. And I think, Amber, you are going to start us off, yeah? Yes. All right. Um, I, uh, I apologize. <laughs> I know you're not supposed to do that, but this is a bit of a downer, so hopefully that's okay. Um, it's called, You Won't Believe What Really Happened to This Day by Women. After the attack, we pulled ourselves shut like hospital curtains, snap. They out there, we in here, pain distilled through tiny wires and tubes, pain concealed and compressed until someone has great need of it, until it becomes a gift. History will tell you we made quick peace with our rapists, bore them children, married them. History will tell you how we launched ourselves into the battle like burning arrows, how we landed between kin and assaulters. History will tell you how we united Rome. History likes to lie about women. What really happened was this. When we saw our men at war, we almost went out like candles. It's easy to shrink yourself down when anger burns through you, hot, fierce, like a grass fire. It sucks the oxygen out. It eats up all but the most essential parts, heart, lungs, brain, blood. Everything else diminishes, shadows itself, clears out disease. To shrink after anger is such a relief. To run towards oblivion, a slaking of dark thirst. And Demeter saw us scrambling in her fields like mice and took pity on us, for had she not been assaulted by Poseidon, forced despite all her powers to bear his twins, she knew what it is to carry the weight of so much rage. 
And so she pulled us into her arms up with the soil and the grass, and she scattered us through the skies as stars shimmering and immortal in the night. And for thousands of years, when men looked at those skies, our husbands, our sons, our grandsons, and so on for many generations, they saw us and were filled with remorse, and they remembered what it meant to be a woman at the mercy of men. They built us a temple with statues of ivory and gold, and every seven years, the daughters of Rome wove new dresses for us from the finest cloth on earth. Now we are forgotten. We're faded in the sky and no men remember us. They tell our stories the way they never happened. And though the women can sense that something is wrong, the feeling is too vague for resolution. The halo of lights from the city and the haze from the cars keep us almost hidden from human view. We are growing jaded, sadder. We can only speak in whispers now, but we still remember our power, what our whispers can warn of if we aim them at the right ears, and our choice is coming to a head. Finally unleash our vengeance or forget that we were ever here. We cannot destroy man alone. We lost the ability to do that ages ago. We are so much stardust and only a little earth still anchors us at all, but it is that little bit that keeps us interested, keeps us watching over the women of the world, waiting, hoping for the ones who will say our names. They have only to summon us. They have only to say that they've needed us so. We would swoop down like hawks then, our pain finally put to use, propelling us to the foot of the earth. We would eat evil men like mice. We would rebuild the world in our image, in our glory, in our dazzling beauty and brilliance. And then, only then, would we do the thing they say we did long ago, rid them of their wars and bring them peace beyond dreaming, beyond the imagining of any living thing. This is my turn. Um, I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from my uh, from my collection. Uh, the world doesn't require you. Um, I'm gonna read um, a little bit from a story called uh, "A Loudness of Creatures," um, which is uh, which is narrated by a girl. So suspend your disbelief. Just before Christmas, the sky turned black with a loudness of creatures flying in impossible patterns. Cracks of light peeked through their ragged feathers. Their wingspans took our breath from us, my little brothers and me. And we pointed and oohed by the window. Every so often the birds would flap their impressive wings and we wondered how they stayed up there with so little effort. Both day and night the bawling from the sky left us awake and red eyes. Some call the birds cry cries because of their anguished wails. The screeches are truer to me. Mahad and Jamal ran about flapping and squawking until only told them to shut their mouth. This is not the joke you think it is, she said. My father, my uncle, and about six or seven important men sat in my dad's bed and talking real quiet. Josh's dad was there, as was Andrew's mother, the only woman in the bunch. From time to time, they raised their voices in anger, but it would always settle back to a low grumble. Do them like the wolves, a voice not my father said. Bang, bang, do them like the wolves. Sarai, my mother called. Take your brothers downstairs, please. It wasn't at all fair of only to tell me to wrangle two curious five-year-olds. Seems to me now that was her job. But I didn't complain back then. I said, okay, you little rat. You heard me. Downstairs. The little rats ran about, one clockwise, the other counter. Squawking, squawking, squawking. Saliva running down their chins. My father stepped from the room, looking taller than usual. His face disturbed and heavy. I froze. I grabbed the fleeing Jamal as he dashed by and pulled him close. I'd seen his face on my father before, and a beating usually followed. He called our names and knelt so he was eye level with my brothers. He pulled us all in, hugging us too tight. The boys squirmed. My back hurt, but I didn't fight. Daddy pressed his face to my stomach. I felt the wetness of his tears soaking my shirt. I love you all, and your mother loves you all. And your Uncle Charles, he does too. My uncle walked by, a silver platter in his hand. Atop it 
the Charlie Wolf that was to be our holiday centerpiece. Charlie, my father called, but my uncle didn't look back as he moved swiftly out the door. We watched by the window as Uncle Charles bowed before the flying birds in an exaggerated gesture of respect. The important men mumbled among themselves while my parents watched stoically. And when my father could take no more, he turned and shambled away. One of those big black things landed in front of my uncle. With his beak, the bird knocked the wolf from the platter and stared down at Charles, at Uncle Charles with a condescending glare. Good Lord, Josh's dad said, the offering. It screeched in Uncle Charles' face, a sound like 12 air raid sirens. I could feel the sound vibrating at my feet. My uncle was surely now deaf. His eardrums ruptured. Another bird landed and let out more screeching. The two birds rose above his head, beating their wings into one another, pecking at feathers and flesh. My uncle raised his arms in protection. My father burst into the room, shotgun in hand. No, Andrew's mother called. This is the ritual. Fuck the ritual, my father cried. That's my only brother. Some of the important men screamed and snatched at him. He held firm to his weapon, swinging it all about. I'll shoot, he called. I'll shoot. My brothers clung tight to my legs, tears staining their cheeks and shirts. I assured them things would be fine, but my wet face was no better than theirs. Reno, my mother said finally. Reno, this is the ritual. He held the gun at her, the only thing between him and the door. But the tension had broken. We all knew my father couldn't shoot my mother. This is the ritual, she repeated. Fuck the ritual, my father said, lowering the gun, tears in his eyes. That's my little brother. By then, one screecher lay dead and the other had snatched Uncle Charles, talons piercing his side, blood dripping through the street. He flopped about like a doll in that bird's embrace climbing higher and higher into the sky. The layer of screeches that blocked the blue cleared, first slowly and all at once. The loudness flew off, leaving nothing but bird shit and the air splitting whales in its wake. For the first time in weeks, I could see the turquoise and we could see the sun. And now all I felt for them was a fierce hatred. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, I am going to read um, a new story um, that uh, speaks to my, my, my passionate feelings about the film um, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Okay. Um, this is called The South Asian Speaker Series Presents Archaeologist and Adventurer Indiana Jones. But if you ask me, said Indiana Jones, it belongs in a museum. He paused to let that sink in. He was sitting on stage across from the moderator, an Indian woman whose name he'd failed to catch. Her legs were crossed at the knee, the legs he'd remember. He reached for the water on the tiny table between them and sipped. The moderator uncrossed her legs and shifted to face the audience. Let's pause here and take some questions. He followed her gaze to the masses overflowing into the aisles lined up along the walls. For the first time that evening, he tried to distinguish faces. Many of them were colored, faces of color. Not a bad thing. His best friend was Egyptian. A microphone was passed to the first questioner, a brown-skinned man. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Jones. I'm wondering about the Indian village, the one that sent you on your quest to retrieve a mystical stone. The Shankara stone, correct. The villagers sent me to retrieve it and save their kidnapped children from a demonic cult. I was just wondering what the village was called. I don't remember. You don't remember? I'd just ridden a raft down a waterfall. You'll forgive me if I don't remember the name of the village. Indy gave a one-sided grin. I believe it was Mayapur the moderator filled in, consulting her notes. That's it, Mayapur, Indy said. And the leader of the village was named Shaman. Shaman, said the questioner, just Shaman, correct. So if I went to this Mayapur and went around asking for a guy named Shaman, people would be like, yeah, Shaman lives over on, I don't know, Cherokee Street. Look, pal, I don't know what your problem is. My problem is that all these names sound made up. All names are made up. Hey, I was named after my pet dog. Silence. Indy took a long gulp of water. The world had grown unfriendly to his form of research. 
what he wouldn't give to be back in the jungles of Honduras or jumping trains across Nazi occupied Europe where he could let his whip do the talking. He'd taken this gig for the honorarium mainly. For the final question, the moderator pointed to a tiny woman with billowing black hair. Mr. Jones, she said, already annoying him for he had a PhD. Is there merit to the argument that these relics belong not in European museums, but in the places they've been looted from? You know what, Indy said, I have a couple of questions. Have you been whipped and force fed the blood of Kali? Have you been crippled by a voodoo doll? I did all that, not for myself, but for the villagers of that village and their children. I'm the good guy here, not the bad guy. Dr. Jones said the moderator, the question had to do with looted objects. Well, guess what, joke's on you. His voice trailed off. He was thinking of the Holy Grail, the cup of the King of Kings, falling out of his grasp, tumbling into a chasm beneath the temple of the sun. Quietly, he said, I've never put anything in a museum. I'll stop there. Thank you. Oh, those are all so amazing. Um, I'm going to read, I'm just going to read the opening from um, a story in Wolf. Um, called Slumberland, and um, I am in I'm in Florida right now. I've been here for since March, and will be here <laughs> for the foreseeable future, maybe forever. Who knows? Um, and this is yeah, very much based on on my sister's neighborhood where I am now. So here's the opening of Slumberland. I spent that summer driving around at night and taking photographs because I could not stand the sound of my neighbor wailing through the walls. This neighbor lived in the apartment above me and when I passed in the stairwell, she looked perfectly regular. But at around 10 o'clock at night, she would start carrying on and her uncorked sadness had a physical effect on me. My skin itched, my teeth ached, a clear liquid leaked from one of my ears. Once I even got a nosebleed. I wondered if our other neighbors could hear her and if anyone had knocked on her door or called building management to complain. I did not knock on her door or call building management to complain because I did not want to confront whatever was happening in my neighbor's apartment. I wanted only to get away. The apartment complex I was fleeing was north of Orlando, situated between the Deltona Lakes and the Seminole State Forest. My life there seemed provisional, even though I had no immediate plans to move, and so it felt natural to wander. As I drove around looking for things to photograph, I added up what little I knew about my neighbor. She had lived in the apartment complex for six months. I did not know her first name, but from the mailboxes, I knew her last, Novak, unless that name was left over from the people who had lived there before, which was possible. Until this wailing situation, I had not paid particularly close attention to the mailboxes. My neighbor had a shoulder tattoo that spelled out something inscrutable in dainty cursive lettering. I often passed her hauling swollen bags from Dollar Tree up and down the stairwell. I had no idea what she did for a living. We had never really spoken, just waves and nods. She used to have a cat, but a few months after she moved in, the cat vanished. I remembered seeing signs in the laundry room, a photo of a black and white cat, the offer of a meager reward. Things my neighbor did not know about me. I have taken photographs all my life. My first camera was a Kodak. I used to make my living as a wedding photographer moving into the apartment complex. I migrated over to pet portraiture. There was a surprising amount of money to be made in photographing German shepherds in bow ties. Plus, no one ruins their life by getting a dog. When I ran out of facts about my neighbor, I cataloged the subjects I had photographed so far. A sinkhole, roadkill, the molten night air and all the near invisible things floating through it. The sidewalks still damp from afternoon rains, the long dark arcs of highways, fluorescent lit parking lots, malls. Was a specific and terrible sadness to the malls, those places where people went to give in to their loneliness. 
Sometimes I photographed human beings, a man sleeping under the scant shelter of a bus stop, a waitress smoking a cigarette outside an IHOP. Sometimes I parked in an unfamiliar neighborhood and walked around with my camera, my armpits dripping under my shirt. That was how I got the mother and son haloed in the warm light of their kitchen. The mother was kneeling in front of her son who looked to be about six or seven and dabbing ointment on his forehead with her pinky finger. So precise, so tender. Their house didn't have front lights or a fence. And so to get this shot, I crept onto their lawn, moving in a squat like the creature of the night I was becoming ashamed of how much I enjoyed it. If apprehended by the mother, I could have said, I had what you had once or a version of it. And I longed to visit that lost world. And I will stop there. Um, all right, short stories and why we love them and spend so much time um, writing them. I, I thought, um, I would start by posing kind of a general question about form. I think, I, I mean, as someone who sort of moves back and forth um, between like short form and long form, I think one thing that's been striking to me from like a process POV is that even though the short story is compact and like economy is sort of built into the form, like for me, it feels like a very liberating space. I don't know if y'all feel that way, but I think with a novel, even though theoretically, like we have so much more space and so many more things can happen, we can include so much more. I end up feeling like a, a bit sort of imprisoned by the creature that I, I have created at a certain point. Um, but I often um, feel this kind of a really pleasing sense of like freedom and latitude um, when I'm working in the short form. And I'm just, I just know, if, I guess y'all feel that way too. And if yes, like, what do you feel like the short form makes available to you in, as writers or in terms of telling stories? Like what, what is sort of accessible to you in the short form that maybe isn't as accessible in other, in other forms? Um, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll jump in just first and say that like, I, I, this panel is actually dangerous for me to do because I am working on a novel right now. And of course, uh, you know, I'm like, oh, the short stories, they're so great. Um, so uh, <laughs> for exactly that reason, um, you know, and I, and I know, Laura, you know, I've actually talked about this before, but, but um, you know, just even listening to all the different stories or, or bits of stories that folks read here tonight, like um, the structure is for me, I think the most freeing thing about the short story, like you can't in a novel I'm finding you can't just go, you know what, I'm going to write this whole thing as a list. I mean, you can, there's like a few people who have done that. <laughs> and that's, you know, a 700 page list or, you know, um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this from the POV of a, you know, dog or whatever it is. And there's something that's just so, um, or, or even just write this as a joke, right? Um, write this as like a funny bit. Um, and you can do that with a short story and, and just play around. And it's like that sense of play, I think, is, is, is so like freeing for me when I'm working on short stories and feels a little bit lost when I'm, when I'm working on a novel just because, yeah, there's so much space, but, but you can't sort of um, do the same, I think, kind of crazy things in the space of a novel for like 400 pages that you can for, you know, four. Yeah, I think the uh, novel, the space novel, the, the space of a novel makes me hyperventilate. <laughs> you know, I, I, every day, every day I'm working on a novel, I'm just like, this is, this is, this is too much. Uh, it, it, the constraint, I mean, even the shorter, the shorter you get, like Flash, you know, um, you, it, it just loosens up your, um, your, your freedom and your creativity because you have to go up against that, up against that constraint and it, uh, it just brings something out. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm also writing a novel, so I also feel like this is <laughs> dangerous. Um, there's something about taking, although when I'm working on the novel, I feel like the only way I can manage it is by thinking of it as like mini arcs. Like if I can just get to this little thing that happens and I'm done, even though I'm not done. But, um, but yeah, I feel like the 
risks feel self-indulgent, like the formal risks in a novel, if it, it just feels like it can be self-indulgent. And I feel like even when I'm reading a short story and maybe it's cause we've, I mean, we all probably read like tons of short stories but I'm, I'm kind of looking for the risk now. Like I'm looking for the thing that makes me go, oh, this is not the story I thought I was re reading. And if I don't get that, I, I, I'm kind of like, you know, that kind of make me upsets me. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's sort of, I feel like the thing that you're almost aiming for is that kind of break away from the swerve away from whatever the reader is expecting you to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I love that, that idea of the swerve. And I wonder too, if there's something about novels where just like for, for most of us, at least, unless you're one of those people who can write like a really amazing novel in a month and yeah, we don't need to hear from them right now. <laughs> 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 forever maybe um but I, yeah but i think it's like you know if in a, if in a story draft if you kind of like swerve and ultimately you don't swerve in the right direction but it like but like the accident of it was kind of important it's uh, but you know if you do that in a novel i mean it can be as essential and sort of necessary but it could i mean that but it could take like a year potentially or six months or two years to kind of understand where you went off course and why it was necessary and what the lesson sort of was and then to like backtrack and you know and to and to like go down kind of the 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 better rabbit hole where i yeah i wonder if some of it is just like temporal you know there's freedom in um in knowing that if you're writing a 10 page short story and you kind of swerve and even if you you need to backtrack and go down a different rabbit hole, you're yeah the the temporal implications aren't necessarily as as grave. But um, but yeah, there is also like really something to that. You just don't have the burden of sustainability. You know, like I think of some of the story. Like there's some of the, particularly some of the more kind of like conceptual stories in Wolf. Um, there's a story about a woman who impersonates um, wives for bereaved husbands, and like I had a great time being in for 12 pages, I could not keep that premise going for, you know, even like a short novel, 100, mm -hmm. 150 pages. Um, but I, yeah, there, I, I know it's counterintuitive, like in some ways you would think that the, the compactness would lead to feeling limited. But I think for me, it's sort of the opposite that I feel kind of like maximal freedom um, mm -hmm. when some doors are, yeah, are, are, are kind of foreclosed in a way. I, I feel like that that the I mean if we're gonna get into Wolf let's get into Wolf I I just love that collection so much I I feel like the 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 you know your work has been described so much as haunting and I I feel like the haunting the hauntedness comes from how short they are and how much they leave out and the negative space and what is being withheld and what characters are withholding from themselves um, as much as the reader and I I I think. I mean, I'm basically agreeing with you, but I, I, I felt like, you know, like I read Lizards recently and I was, it was just so interesting the way it moves between two different consciousnesses. Not, neither of them never, they never really quite know what the other one is really understanding. Each one understands more than the other thinks, but you know, it's that, it's that negative space between them that makes it so creepy um, and disturbing. I, I think that the short form is so well suited to that. Um, in fact, in all of your, I've been revisiting all of your stories and there's something about that short, it reminds me how the short form can do that, hold so much mystery. Yeah. I this, uh, oh, go ahead. Okay. No, I was just saying, I had, this, I had this professor one time who told me um, that if you want to write novels, you actually have to end, like you actually have to know how to end a novel. Uh, but if you, can, if you want to write stories, you don't really need to know how to end them. And, you know, obviously that's oversimplifying, but, but I sort of, I sort of feel like that to, to your point, it's like, you can have these sort of like mysteries floating in, in, in the ether um, and, and, you know, just go kind of, okay, okay, okay. Now I've, now I've seen this one. Now I've seen this one. And you don't need like the ending that you sort of need to stick uh, with the novel. And there is sort of this greater sense of mystery or like, you know, protoplasm that sort of surrounds all of the stories in that way. And I love that. Yeah. I was thinking, I read it in this interview with um, Deborah. I think it, I'm pretty sure it was Deborah Eisenberg. It was a long time ago. If it's not, if it wasn't Deborah Eisenberg, then I <laughs> apologize to whoever said this. But, um, but uh, yeah, it was this idea. I think she was being asked a question in an interview, like, 
it seems like in our, you know, short attention span world that like short stories should be wildly popular in the way that um, TV shows are wildly popular and like why aren't people just consuming short fiction the way that they like binge watch Netflix. Um, and her answer to that was sort of very much, I think, speaking to like the negative space that you were talking about, Tanya, where it's like the form is the just like the very movement of the form is designed to kind of leave us in a place of instability as opposed to a space of resolution. Um, you know, I think some with a short story, like we begin on the edge of one cliff and we also end on the edge of a cliff, but maybe it's a different cliff than the one that we started out on. But it's, I, I know, you know, it's like, I feel like with my students, you know, students are, um, aren't are used to reading short stories very often. They're like, this was great, but it just kind of stopped in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes, it takes some time to kind of get the brain around that sort of movement, right? Where it's like the, 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 the ambition here is really not necessarily um, to, I mean, there's some stories that do, of course, but like for a lot of stories, the ambition really isn't to move towards a space, but just to kind of get to that next cliff's edge and the, tra and the trajectory of that and what it means and why it matters. But I, yeah, I think the, the, the space and the atmosphere that stories leave us in is often sort of more just, Realizing their novels tend to leave us. I, I think that was sort of Eisenberg's point that it's like, you know, this is actually because of that something that you necessarily want to read, you know, right before bed or when you're on your commute or, or whatever. Um, because stories have a way of leaving us um, feeling like like sort of the ground under our feet is shifted and we've gotten to an end, but also to come to an end means to sort of come to a new beginning too. I'm, I'm glad you said that, Laura, because like I, I think I feel like you're a master at that, you know. I um I, I, I the note that I wrote at the end of the book, I was like, it's almost like resolution is, is beside the point in these stories, and I and I just absolutely love that. Yeah, cool. yeah, that's there. The the um the thing that I love about your stories, and actually just about I think all almost all of my favorite short stories, um, you know, are it's almost a place to explore character more than it is to explore, you know, obviously a novel, you, you're exploring something that's, you know, big and epic and a lot of things are happening and there's much more plot. And it's not to say that there isn't plot or plenty of plot, but um, I always find it the, sort of the most interesting um, to look at sort of that negative space and like the tension between the characters and sort of the mystery there about people not quite connecting. Um, you know, which is, which is something that I see a lot in your stories that just like the, the sort of just missed, missed trains um, yeah. from two different people metaphorically. Um, and I think it's so much easier, or not easier to do that in a story, but, but it's, there's a space to do that in a story that I think in a novel would be like really unsatisfying for, for people in some, in some sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think of it, it's a bit like putting like a grain of sand under a microscope, you know, where you're taking this sort of tendril of time. And I think even stories that cover huge amounts of time do this too in their, in their way. And I, I really, I, I feel very drawn to stories that have a lot of time and a lot of, um, cover a lot of time, span a lot of time in an event. But it's, yeah, but I still feel like it's, it's kind of like putting this grain of sand under a microscope where you're taking kind of one sort of tendril of experience and you're looking at it like really really closely and there's sort of intensity and complexity that comes with the magnification um and and the, the sort of like hyper focusedness um yeah of stories i i also wanted to ask about sort of collections more holistically i mean i think like for me, the collections that sort of move me and speak to me the most, it feels very much like entering into a world, um, even if the stories aren't necessarily explicitly linked, but it's like you are kind of entering a world with its own sort of weather system and its own laws. Um, and its own way of thinking and being. And that's something that I thought about, I, I think about so much when putting together collections. Um, and I had kind of an experience where it's like, I had at some point, like a lot of material, like 400, I think I had almost 400 pages of stories. Um, and then I was trying to figure out like, what is sort of the book? Because I was like, no, nobody, myself included, wants a 400 page story collection. <laughs> um, but yeah time to kind of like actually pull the book out of out of all of those pages and I was wondering how um 
you all, like, how do you think about putting together a collection? How do you think about sort of where, do, where you begin, where you end, what goes in, what goes out? How, how do you think about shaping the world of the book? I, I think probably Rian and Amber are better. I feel like it was a long time ago when I wrote a collection or published a collection, but I, I do remember one thing that was kind of um, a learning experience for me, which is a, a lot of my stories were sort of realist stories or recognizable worlds. And, um, and I had one or two stories that fell outside that realm or actually just one. And it was like clearly like surreal and strange. And um, and I it, we had to go back and forth with my editor so many times about it because I think, and I trust her completely, but I, I think she felt like it didn't fit with that, that somehow everything has to be of the same kind of world and atmosphere. And I just, I felt, and I still feel like I've never been able to figure out what is my lane. And I'm, <laughs> I just can't, I just can't commit. I, can, I just love, and it, part of it is that I read, you know, you know, a, a stories by people that are, you know, I don't know, part of it is that sometimes I think an experience is better, better translated through surrealism or, or some other form than, than the realist model. And um, I just, I just wish at the time, I felt like there should be more room for trying on different skins within the space of a single collection. And I think probably now there is, I think people have more tolerance for that, but I, I, I kind of felt like at the time it was a, it was a big, it was a big decision. Like you, you have to kind of declare who you are as a writer, stake your territory and, you know, kind of be consistent with that. But I don't know if you guys have felt any similar pressure or not really at all. Yeah, I think, um, you know, actually, it, it, it's something I struggled with too, and it wasn't really till my last collection before this one, till the unfinished world, when I worked with um, Katie Adams, who was like this, just my uh, this amazing editor um, at Live Right, and she was it was such an amazing experience because she was like really the first person to sort of crystallize for me, like no, no, like uh, like what you were saying, like all these stories, like your work is like all over the place, and you don't like necessarily want to like stick to like you know, a, a, a rigid theme or, or anything like that. But she, so, uh, you know, I was like, well, okay, how do I do this then? And, um, you know, she was like, your stories, like, it, it's about a feeling, I think, with you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's almost like enter, and, and I, that really stuck with me. Like, um, you know, I like people to feel when they're reading a collection of mine that they're entering sort of a dreamscape, I guess. Um, and that there is a certain amount of sort of immersion um, and and a sort of you know journey that they're taking. Um, and I, you know I have a I use I talk about this a lot, but I have a friend who describes it as a diving bell, and I love that metaphor because you know you're sort of up here, and and then you just take the reader down 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 down, and they're fully immersed, and then you start bringing them up back up for the last half of the collection. And obviously there's a million ways to do it, but I love that because um, it doesn't mean that, it means that I can write about, you know, vampires and werewolves and, and space and queens and all kinds of things, um, but that, uh, and, and realism too, but, but that there has to be this sense of like suspended, um, suspended uh, reality or the sense that you have sort of stepped through a door and entered another place that is just a little bit different. Um, and, and that there's sort of that feeling of, of a dream um, sort of without. And it's, it's a hard thing to sort of, I guess, achieve. And I don't know if I've achieved it, but like that, that sort of became my, like, my guiding principle when putting together collections. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, with my first book, I was, I was sort of thinking of it like some, like some of my favorite like albums, you know? I was thinking of it like, a, like I remember Outcast's first album was, uh, was, um, you know, it was it, it was close to sort of traditional hip hop, and but it, it had a little, it had enough weirdness in it that, that you knew that. Well, later in retrospect, you knew that you know, things would get crazy later. That's kind of how I thought of my first my first book. I was like, you know, I had some of the stories in my second book. My second book is a little bit crazier than my first book. And I had some of the second stories, but I, some of the stories, but they just didn't feel like they they would they felt like they were overwhelmed. You know, something. I wanted to I wanted to establish that. You know, I, I sort of wanted to establish that. Now I write about this world, um, 
that is um, that is like our is like our world, but it's uh, it's you know slightly off. And I wanted to establish establish that. Um, and um, and so I, you know for, for the first book, I was really thinking of you know stories that that were that were sort of like you know here like that, that that felt more more here and now. And then it kind of got um, and the second book kind of got into more magical realist um, surreal aspect of things. Um, and I, I kind of feel like I'm just going to keep going in that in that in that direction and let it and let it get as crazy as, as, as it can be. <laughs> but you know what? What I was thinking today, what, what I was when I was reading um, when I was reading your book, Laura, is that I feel like I feel like I um, you know my stories are you know are you know they're all like I said they're all in the same world and you know they started sort of referencing each other a, a little bit and I, I feel like I, I'm uh, I'm missing out on what a lot of other <laughs> story writers are doing. Um, in that, or, or reading your book, and, and, and each story is like a, a it's, it's a new, it's, it's a new world, even though it feels, even though it feels similar. Um, so I mean, you know, I, again, so I, I, I really enjoy this. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's the challenge of that is, I, I think like ordering becomes really critical because that is something that I thought about Tanya, the, the like, there's some stories that are full on speculative, some stories that are more realist, some stories that are sort of in this like nether space between some stories that are very topical like lizards, some stories that aren't. And I was actually a friend of mine, I can't take no credit for the order because I had sent the book to a writer friend and somehow I was thinking of order like in the most like, like just sort of bluntly like literal way that I was like maybe the story should that's called last night should be last because it's called <laughs> because it's called last night so we should put it at the end and maybe like all of the story should be like clumped together um and I yeah and I I think she completely I mean and Brianna you were saying like like an album I mean I think she like was like no need to kind of build this like movement um and sort of you know, kind of the order should needs to have like tension and contrast and you feel like this kind of argument or conversation is building over the course of the book. So she, she like, yeah, completely redid the order and it was like so much better than anything I could have ever, ever come up with. But I, yeah, I mean, I sort of love collections that have that kind of like, I think Friday Black is a great example of a collection that um, in terms of world can like move through so many Years where we have the the sort of um, the more uh, realist the this this you know the speculative the satirical and and I and I think again like that the order of that collection is brilliant where we sort of instead of feeling we're like we're kind of in like the worlds are disconnected it's like we're moving through in this very kind of deliberate way um, where yeah where it's kind of like one. Um, yeah, one one sense of reality is sort of giving giving not only giving way to another, but sort of building on another. So there are these like layers of reality are occurring as we move through the book. But I yeah, I love thinking about um, yeah short story construction and order, and can just like talk about that all night. Um, I I will I will restrain myself because um, I think it is maybe time to move to questions. Um, Liz, does that sound wherever you are? Does that sound right? Yeah, absolutely. We can um, we can like weave these into what where the conversation was going. It doesn't have to okay. hear too much. Um, there's a question from Kawhi Washburn, a very fine writer himself, um, and he's asking, "I wonder what each of you find most challenging about writing besides finding the time and space to write." Ha ha. Is it, say, capturing the interior of your characters on the page, rendering a language that feels precise to the subject, finding the inner truth slash surprise of the story itself, et cetera? It's kind of a hard question, but you can go into it whichever way you'd like. I, I, I would say for me, I, I know I know what my my weak point is, or one of my weak points, which is that I tend to over talk about the interior, like I have to over explain the interiority, which is funny because I always am telling my students, this is maybe cut back, cut back. And then in my own drafts, I'm like really explaining every, you know, everything the, the character is thinking. And I feel like that kind of pairing back and kind of having more restraint in that regard. But I, 
I do feel like that is sort of my challenge. And I, I mean, I also think, I think that, I think Kauai, you like mentioned, you, you answered it for me too, because I forgot that, that surprise element, that, that thing, that, that accident, I think Laura mentioned it as like a ha accident, like that accidental moment. And it only comes from sort of trusting your intuition in some way, um, which, which I think is also something you hone over, over years and drafts and you become friendly with failure and you, you accept the failure and the, 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 the sort of length of time to which you can devote yourself to uncertainty um, becomes longer, I think, the longer you write. Um, but what do you guys, what do you guys think? Oh, wow. So many things, so many things are so very hard all the time. Um, yeah, I, I we're, how, how much time do we have? Where do I begin? <laughs> right, um, like everything. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think, um, I think for me, like one of the most important questions that I can ask myself about a story in progress is like, what is happening here in this world and with the characters that can't be bound by language? Um, which might sound kind of counterintuitive because as writers, like our medium is language, but to sort of understand like what is happening in the world that, that can't be sort of spoken to directly, but has to be come at sort of sideways and, and has to be sort of animated through movement of the story. And like, once I really understand what that unbindable material is, so many other things suddenly become really clear. I feel like it's like when I understand that it's the end, it's like the end of like the usual suspects, you know, when the detective looks at the board and then starts to like put all the pieces together and it's like, oh my God. Kevin Spacey was Kaiser Soze all along. Um, but that's like, yeah, that's like, the, like when I like find the, the unbindable material, then I, I, I have my version of the, of the end of the usual suspects. Um, but, but I think it takes like, it just, it takes a lot of kind of sitting with questions and working and reworking and working and reworking. And I am very impatient by nature. I'm like an air sign. I like things to happen fast, fast, fast. Um, and so it goes against my nature in some ways to sort of be in that space of waiting and to be in that space of patience. But I also, I don't know, I don't know how else to do it. Um, and, and I think that that's, yeah, I mean, I think it is sort of perennially like forever will be a challenge for me. Um, but, and I don't know if I'll ever become like go good at being in that space of waiting, but I, I feel like it's, it's also really essential. Uh, for me, it's just, this is so cliche, but it's just writing. <laughs> like, like the actual act of sitting down and putting things on a piece of paper um, or, you know, into a keyboard or whatever. It's, it's um, the, the, the other stuff, you know, I, I, I'm of course one of those writers, I love editing and, and all of my sort of the good things that fall into my story fall into there during the editing process. So that I think makes it a lot harder for me to write because it's just so much crap coming out like when I'm writing and it makes it's not like rewarding or fun. It's like the, you know, vomiting that I have to do to like get to the get to the uh, healthy part. And um, and uh, so I think, you know, I know Kwai, you, you and I have even talked about this, just like literally having time <laughs> um, to to do that. And, and especially when you don't have that much time to then sit there and go, okay, now I'm gonna do this really unpleasant thing that's like not gonna make me feel better. It's gonna make me feel a hundred times worse about myself as a, as a human being. Um, and so let's spend two hours doing that. Uh, uh, but, um, but then, you know, once I have written also, you know, so cliche that I just, I feel like so much better than if I had actually, you know, watched a movie on Netflix or something. I think for me, it's uh, kind of like listening to the characters and, and figure out, you know, what, what, what do they want? Why are you, why are you here? You know, I have a character that, I, that I've written. I mean, he, he made appearances in both my books, he, you know, but I don't feel like I've gotten him right, you know? Um, and, you know, he, he's like, he's like the main character of my novel. So it's kind of like, I need to actually figure it out, <laughs> figure out how to get him right. And it's, you know, so it's just sort of just trying to figure out, you know, listen to them and figure out, you know, how, 
how to how to sort of render their you know that that internal internalness onto the page. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I just want to take a moment to tell John Domini, we cannot see you. Um, so there's, there's some notes in the, the side. So this is only, you can only see the people here. So if you're at home watching, you can relax and we are not peering into your, your living room. Um, but this is really cool. We have a question from Debbie in Cornwall. So I'm just going to go over there for a second because um, that's so cool that she's up and watching. Um, and she says, I'd love to know what portion of yourselves you feel you put into your writing. Where are you on that dial of vulnerability? Mm. I'm sure. Yeah, that's a question. I think it is such a mix for me. I mean, the first story in Wolf last night is basically, I mean, there's there are a few sort of, there are a couple of made up things in there, but it's like basically autofiction. Um, but that's an unusual story for me. I don't, I don't really write that close to the bone of my own experience very often. Um, I think in most cases, it's, it's, it's just it's weird. Yeah, it's often, um, I, I think like what is often really true is landscape. I mean, so much of the Florida that's in this book is sort of the Florida that I know really well where I grew up, where my family's from. Um, and then kind of what happens in those spaces is really, born of the imagination, even if there is also still some sort of emotional autobiography mixed in. Um, I think, you know, one thing that's kind of like endlessly fascinating to me, um, there's a story in uh, in Wolf called Hill of Hell that opens with like a, um, a two people have a conversation on a train. And that came, was very much like, came from a conversation, a long conversation about just like life and death and it got like so gnarly in a great way so fast um, that I had on a train, a long train ride with a colleague. And, and I had had this idea that I had wanted to write a story um, about that. And it was all going to be set on the train in my imagination. And I wrote draft after draft of that story all set on the train. And it was just like, they were just not good. And everything that was really moving um, and interesting about uh, that the real life conversation was was totally absent in those versions of the story. And that, so like, that was a true thing that really demanded fictionalization. Like I needed to break from the lived experience. I needed to write in into, um, in, I jumped way forward in time, wrote into experiences that that I have not had uh, at all. Um, and, but, but like in a same sort of way, like reaching deeper and deeper into fiction allowed me to sort of bring to the page the 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 experience that I had had in life, um, and I think that that's so interesting. And last night was kind of the opposite, where I had tried to write a very fictionalized version of that story, and then really did ultimately need to, to strip it down in kind of like an essayistic um, type of voice, but. I, um, but that, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I don't, I, I, you all have had that experience, but, but right, sometimes like we, we are bringing ourselves to the page, but we really need to kind of like disappear into the portal of fiction to animate those experiences in the fullest way. Yeah, I, I think that's a brilliant question because I think that vulnerability is so important to what we do. And I tend to write about characters who are far from my world or experience and um, like I wrote a novel and there were poachers in it and I was, had a hard time and I spent a lot of time walking around and trying to avoid and trying to put a character who's like me who can kind of tell the story of the poachers and then it's like, but it's very false because my real interest lies with this character who does not seem like me and um, I like this um, exercise Elizabeth Strout she published this in the Guardian or something she was talking about how she basically just takes an emotion that she's feeling like she, you know, if you're, you're dreading, you know, having to do dental work that day. Um, and, and she takes that feeling and she kind of puts it on the character's shoulders. And because it's so close to her own vulnerability or her own emotion, she can kind of give it to a character who, who isn't necessarily getting dental work done, but, but, you know, she can just send them off. And there's a kind of honesty to, to how she's rendering the character that way, rather than, um, trying to impose something on the character and make the character kind of do what you want them to do. Um, and I've always found that really helpful, like that kind of in the body, like trying to step into the body through an emotion that you are, I think this is what you're talking about, Laura, that you, Laura, that you're an emotion that you're familiar with, 
and then kind of animating it through the character. That's really interesting. That's basically the definition of like method acting too, yes. right? Yeah. Just taking it in your body and relaying it in a different way. Yeah. Um, we don't have much time, but there's so many good questions. So I'm just gonna ask a couple really quickly. Um, and there's one more um, just technical question that I thought we had to get to from Brandon. Um, what are your, some of your considerations when deciding point of view intents? Do these factors differ for a short story versus a novel? Does anyone wanna, Rian, anyone? <laughs> Um, I've never read a novel though. Yeah, 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 never mind. Yeah, you're a bad choice. I think, I, you know, I, for, for me, it's interesting because I have like, I've definitely done, um, like I do stories in like every POV. Um, and uh, I, I've talked about this a little bit, but I, I, I tend to find that I think, you know, there's like the second person POV, right? That everyone hates or, or, or people love it or they hate it. It's very controversial. Um, and, and I tend to love it, um, but I, I like to use it when I'm actually, you know, speaking of trauma, when I'm looking at things that are, that are, that are more traumatic or something that is more of a vulnerable um, place for me. Um, and, uh, you know, likewise, um, I'll, I'll sort of, it's weird and not intuitive, but I actually use first person a lot more when I'm looking at something that, um, a character that is actually far from my own experience. Um, uh, I find it sort of easier, I think, to get into the eye of that character um, if it's if it's somebody who um, is is living something really different than me. So, but I actually am struggling with that a little bit with the novel because um, I've, I've changed the tense about fifteen times, and I'm sure I'll change it fifteen more times. Um, you know, from like the sort of like omniscient, you know, third person to to very close um, close third to a first. Um, because yeah, that's like such a huge commitment. As a story writer, I'm, I'm terrified of that commitment. Yeah, I think I don't think about tense or point of view super critically with short stories. I just, it's like, I just hear what I hear. And I think for a first person, like I, when I when I'm working with in a first person voice, like it's like, I am, the thoughts are coming through me. Um, it, it does feel not to be like too woo woo about it, but it, like, it does feel a bit like, like channeling and when I'm in a third person voice it feels more like I have kind of a, a direct line into someone else's thoughts and sort of yeah I just kind of hear it and I hear tense in the same way so I, I mean I think for me in the short form those are just super intuitive and um if the first line is written in present tense like there's a pretty decent chance that it will stay first person present tense I completely agree with what you're saying Amber I think with a novel it's very different because, you know, you, again, you're thinking about sort of sustainability and, um, and, and you might get 50 pages in and be like, if I have to write any more in the first person present tense, I'm going to be like very unhappy. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, so I, I think that that's a, it's a, it's a more weighted choice in that way. And I think it's, it's kind of more about like, you know, what sort of perspectives and temporalities do you need to like bring to bear to, uh, you know, allow the story to sort of expand um, over the space and time that it, it needs to. Um, so I do think more critically about about those questions of tense uh, for and POV for novels, but with short stories, I just kind of tend to roll with what feels sort of intuitively right. Um. This is devastating, but we are at time. Um, and I wish that we could just like, we should just make this like a weekly thing um, because I, um, you know, there's been so much wonderful positive feedback in the chat, which doesn't always happen. So this is marvelous. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, especially Laura. Um, there were links to all of the books on the sides. Please buy them all. Um, stay safe, everybody, and stay well read. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.